Namaste. Good afternoon. It is wonderful to be back again with all of you, and it's lovely to see you all at the COVID Recover series that is presented by Apollo Hospitals. This is Dr. Srinidhi Chidambaram here. After infection with COVID-19, the recovery period can be very smooth or it can be a bit stormy. It is always a crucial period where the patients need to pay a lot of attention to the right nutrition, sleep, relaxation, and also be aware of post-COVID complications and how to deal with them. The Recover series brings to you twice a week the most important, reliable, and authentic information for those who have had COVID-19 so that they may recover and regain their health and well-being at the earliest. We now know that in many people, COVID-19 causes several post-COVID complications. This can be grouped into many categories. It can be part of the organ damage, which is caused by the infection itself, or it can be due to long-term effects of COVID treatment or hospitalization, or it can be due to what is called long COVID, which is a group of symptoms like brain fog or fatigue or breathlessness or prolonged weakness and joint pains that are seen after being infected, uh, several weeks after being infected with COVID-19. Or it can even be a post-COVID secondary infection like the mucor that we all have been reading about. So it is very important to pay very keen attention to all your symptoms in the post-COVID period distinguish what they are and seek timely medical help as and when it's required. To discuss all this in detail with us, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Sai Praveen Haranath, who will be talking about long-term health of or long-term health effects of COVID-19 infection. Dr. Sai Praveen Haranath is a consultant intensivist and pulmonologist working at Apollo Hospital's Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad. He is the medical director of one of the first tele-ICU programs in India, E-Access. He has a work experience of over 20 years. He is AB American Board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary and critical care medicine with additional degrees of MPH and FCCP. He has received a humanitarian award from UCHC and the Governor's Community Service Award from the American College of Chest Physicians he has completed the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Tobacco Control Leadership Program. He has been involved in multiple presentations and conferences in India and abroad. Hello, Dr. Sai Praveen, and I'm so Hi. happy that amidst your busy schedule, you found time to join us in the Recover series of COVID-19. Uh, we are really looking forward to learning all about post-COVID complications and how to deal with them over to you. Thank you, Dr. Srinidhi. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you for Apollo for organizing these. Uh, much of my day now is spent in answering questions from patients about COVID, answering questions about patients, family members who've had COVID. And we are obviously still seeing new cases of COVID still. And my take home message is still, wash your hands, wear a mask, get vaccinated and physical distancing. And you have heard me before, not social distancing, but physical distancing, six feet apart as much as possible. Now, as Dr. Srinidhi has alluded to, COVID affects pretty much all organ systems. And let me very briefly, just as a refresher, take you through what happens when you get COVID. COVID, as you know, is caused by a virus. It's a tiny, tiny virus, just like a cold virus. It's not much bigger than that. And the cold virus, just like it infects people through the nose and the mouth and the eyes, gets into your air passages, gets through your air tubes, gets into your lungs and then can create an infection. Likewise, COVID does the same thing. The COVID virus gets in and then it goes and gets attached to something called the ACE receptor in your lungs. But in the meantime, your body is not sitting still. It's trying to fight it. Uh, as you know, you have a very good immune system. The immune system has the B cells and the T cells, and they're trying to attack the virus, just like any other infection that happens, whether it's a bacteria or a virus. Now, the unfortunate thing is the body has never seen COVID before, and which is why we are getting these spurts of immune response where some people are really attacking it very hard, some people are not attacking it much. And then the body has to respond with releasing all kinds of chemicals to fight it. And there's something called inflammation that happens. So just as when you get a bump on the hand, you get a little swelling, you get a little swelling inside the lungs. And when that happens, you can't get oxygen in. Let's switch very briefly to what the lungs do. Now, you've all heard that COVID affects your lungs 
lungs the most. So the human lung actually is a gigantic structure. If you stretch it out, it gets to the size of a tennis court, 75 square meters. And in that whole size, you have oxygen coming in, carbon dioxide coming out, and your air tubes, the middle tube is called the trachea that splits about 23 times, ends up in the lungs. And if you actually look at the air moving in, it moves from your nose, your mouth, into your throat, gets into your lungs, then it gets across the lung into the blood vessel, into the red blood cell, goes and fixes itself to the hemoglobin molecule and goes all around the body supplying oxygen everywhere. In COVID, what happens is this entire pathway can get disrupted. So in the acute phase of COVID, you end up with inflammation in the lung, low oxygen. Many people actually feel this as a sensation of breathing difficulty where they're not getting enough air. So I'm sure some of you exercise, exercise is a good thing, by the way, you walk up the stairs, you feel short of breath, but that feeling of shortness of breath, which we call in medical languages as dyspnea, that symptom is there for some people with COVID even after the COVID is gone. So essentially the body is trying to fix and fight this. And like I said, if you get a cut in the hand, you get a scar on the skin, same thing happens in the lungs. The lungs are trying to fight it. The infection is over, the inflammation is over, but you can end up with a scar called fibrosis. And that scarring results in a structure which is not doing the job the lung has to do, which is get oxygen, blow out carbon dioxide. On top of all this, while you're recovering from COVID, your muscles as well as other organ systems have been affected. Now we are finding out that if you actually look at COVID now, you know, scientists have a way of describing things. So we now know that acute COVID is four weeks. Then the prolonged COVID is between four to 12 weeks, which is three months. And anything beyond three months, which is persisting, we are calling it as long COVID or persistent COVID symptoms. And people have all been experiencing it. See, people who've had COVID last year, are some of them are actually still having symptoms now. Now, I had COVID in June. And I'm claiming I'm forgetting things. My wife doesn't agree, though. But she says that it's just you. It's not COVID. So, so people can sometimes forget things. People can also sometimes have issues with uh, weakness in the hands and muscles and the fatigue. If you've ever had a viral infection before, you might remember that even after the virus has gone, you may feel tired and weak. And that's a result of any viral infection, not just COVID. So we are seeing a lot of similarity with other viral infections. We're also seeing some new things. And what are the new things we are seeing? One of them is this inflammation. Now, this inflammation can cause breathing difficulty, and it can also cause you to have wheezing or difficulty because the air tubes get smaller and tighter, and you get this wheezing sensation. We're also noticing a rare phenomenon that some people are getting cardiac side effects where they have an inflammation of the heart and they're having side effects related to that. But again, not very common, but we have seen it. We're also seeing people with general muscle weakness and fatigue. And that seems to persist for some people for a long time. Some people are actually getting sleep disturbance. Some are getting anxiety, depression, some mental health issues. So we're seeing an entire spectrum of problems because of COVID. And it's some of it is directly, you can kind of link it up saying, okay, the lung was affected, so you're short of breath. Some of the things the scientists are still trying to figure out, why are we actually having this symptom? Now, if you look at the history of viral infections, there are other viral infections where we have seen the similar thing. People have had chikungunya, people who had Lyme disease, for example, they, they've had issues with post disease symptoms many months later, even years later. With COVID, now we've had it for over 600 days now, or a year and a half, and we're trying to understand what is happening. The WHO you know, has actually come out with a case report form that doctors can fill out online to record all of this. So hopefully at the end of the year, we'll have enough data to suggest what is going on. Apollo Hospitals, as you know, you know, has various divisions. One of our divisions is the rehab division. And we've actually instituted, and Srinidhi knows this, that we have this rehab section where we're actually doing physiotherapy for people who've had COVID. Some of this is geared towards the lungs. Some of this is geared towards building the strength back. Let me flip over to another part of COVID recovery. If you've been in the hospital or in the ICU, anybody who's been in the hospital ICU knows that you get weak. And why is that? If you're, you know, I'm sitting in the chair right now, but as I'm sitting in the chair, I'm moving a little bit. So my muscles are always active. There's always a muscle that's trying to balance my posture, et cetera. But when I lie down in a hospital bed, if somebody's in the ICU, they're sometimes unconscious. They're sometimes not moving anything. So the muscles aren't working and they become kind of disused and they kind of lose their power and strength. And it takes some time to recover. There's something called the post-intensive care syndrome where people who have been in the ICU end up with weakness because of not moving things. And then you end up with stiff joints. So all of these things play a role. Now, the 
other thing to look at is many people who get COVID already have other problems such as diabetes, hypertension, heart issues, if they're elderly, if their immunity is already low, all of these can lead to a complication. And lastly, if you received medicines to suppress your immunity, like say steroids, for example, that can cause your muscles to weaken. You can also get high blood sugars and diabetes shows up and you get the side effects from that. So to cut a long story short, COVID, yes, it's a new virus, but the body has been fighting it. Some areas of the fighting has not been successful. However, other parts have actually been working. The last point I want to kind of make is that there's one other thing we have noticed in COVID is blood clot formation. And this can happen in the heart, the brain, the lungs, in the legs, et cetera. And we've seen that some people end up with this inflammation and blood clot formation after the COVID has actually gone by. And that's something to watch for. Now, lucky for us that now we know a lot about COVID. We know how to manage the disease really well. We also know how to manage the post-COVID symptoms pretty well right now. Over to you, Srinidhi. You can kind of start answering questions. And if anything else you want me to go back in detail, glad to do that. Sure. Thank you, Doctor. So uh, regarding these post-COVID-19 uh, complications, um, these, I mean, what is the maximum time, like, for example, if somebody is recovered and they're back, and uh, uh, till, what is the maximum time these things can last? I mean, we spoke about... Sure, it. sure. See, in general, we are thinking three to six months. So if it's lasting beyond six months, we really need to investigate more. Of course, like we said, we've only been 18 months into the pandemic, so we don't know what's coming down the line. But in general, they've seen that everything, including the fatigue, the weakness, the anxiety, the depression, the muscle discomfort, as well as the cardiac, the brain effects, all of these, not more than three months. The mental health issues may last a little bit longer, but in general, most people are out of it in three months. But if you've not given any attention to it, if you have not treated it, it may last longer. So at what point of time do you think that, you know, supposing a person gets COVID-19, it might be mild or moderate or severe. Uh, so do, when should they actually seek medical advice? Because everybody knows that, you know, the recovery phase of COVID, they are likely to feel tired. So what are the specific symptoms you think that sure. when they don't have to dismiss it as just or just the post viral. Correct, correct. It's really alarming, and you do need to, uh, I mean, early medical intervention will help. Sure. I'm just going to take a little philosophical bent to that question, and you'll understand why. Most of us don't care about our health. We have really not even cared about getting a regular checkup or glucose or cholesterol, nothing we've done. To me, COVID has suddenly shown a light on our health and said, you know what, you need to pay attention to your health. And I am seeing several people who never even talked about their health are now paying attention to it. To, in, to me, in a way, this is a good thing in the sense that even if they had mild COVID and very minimal symptoms, they're starting to pay attention to their health. And to me, that's helpful because most human diseases are preventable. Diabetes, hypertension, any of those, you can actually control those very well nowadays with modern diet, medicine, exercise. So... In a way, I would say anybody who had COVID, get a checkup as soon as you can after you're recovered, because I have picked up lung cancer, I have picked up diabetes, hypertension, multiple other medical conditions, which they didn't know they had before COVID. So to me, the preventive aspects actually come up where I'm actually able to detect these problems early on. And actually, the COVID has nothing to do with it but they're actually on the path to getting good treatment for many of these other conditions. So from that standpoint, I would say get a checkup as soon as possible. For COVID specifically, you can wait two to four weeks to see if the symptoms are going away. There are some alarm symptoms though. What are the alarm symptoms? Chest pain, shortness of breath that's not going away, weakness in the hands or legs, vision symptoms. You've all heard about the black fungus mucormycosis, so sinus pain, fever that's coming up and not going away. Anything that feels out of place to your usual symptoms or you're getting short of breath or other people are commenting saying, hey, why are you so short of breath? Why are you not able to speak on the phone? All of these things absolutely need to pay attention right away. Because in general, these can be ruled out as serious problems very quickly and easily. It might be as simple as a telemedicine appointment. For example, we do routinely through our, and Dr. Srinidhi knows this, using our online appointments, we're able to look at patients around the world and actually take care of them. But it may require you to go see a doctor who can physically listen to your heart, listen to your lungs, examine your feet, and you know, find out if there's something else going on which may be a complication of COVID. So I would say that four weeks, something's not going away. Absolutely, you see a doctor. Two to four weeks, you can kind of wait and watch, try to get an online appointment. Uh, so Toby spoke about uh, organ damage being one of the uh, uh, 
possible uh, side COVID-19 can right. uh, cause a lot of damage to many of the organs. Sure. Uh, would you like to, I mean, would you like to tell us something more about it as in uh, what kind of uh, organ damage has a lot of long-term effects? Sure. Most common, as you might have seen in your practice. Sure. So uh, I'm a pulmonologist and critical care doctor. So I see a lot of lung related stuff and which seems to be the most common. There's also, of course, mental health issues which are coming up a lot. Anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress. Uh, people who were on oxygen and now you know don't need oxygen but still feel like they're short of breath. There are people who actually had lung damage where there was scarring in the lung, which we mentioned earlier, and they have difficulty in breathing and they're noticing that. So we, are, we need to see them relatively quickly. We're also seeing patients who've had a wheezing happening after the viral infection. And that's also seen in other viruses too. And sometimes they may need medicines to relax the air tubes. And people who have had asthma may have symptoms flare up after this. Now, there's another aspect to this where we're seeing people with uh, cardiac issues. Again, not common, but we have seen people with that. And some people get blood clots. And the blood clots can be in the lungs, which can cause breathing difficulty. They can be in the limbs, which may cause gangrene of the extremities. We've also seen people with uh, kind of strokes in the brain where they have sudden weakness, difficulty in vision. Uh, those have been seen. And rarely, we have also seen heart attacks related to blood clots because of COVID. And that's also known to happen. So any and all of these have a symptom that pops up, like vision disturbance, chest pain, shortness of breath that's not going away. So don't ignore those symptoms, especially if they're not going away. What about the GI system? Do we also see a lot of post-COVID? Um, sure. I've not seen that many. I do know that some people have had difficulty with loss of appetite. I've also seen some people with chronic diarrhea that set in after COVID. But other than that, I've not seen anything major so far. There have been the rare, rare instances of this blood clot situation in the gut where they had you know, needed surgery. But otherwise, it's a very unusual thing for the GI thing to be prolonged. But there are some schools of thought which say that some people with irritable bowel syndrome have or inflammatory bowel disease, they've had some disturbances because of this. Uh, there are, of course, side effects of the drugs. So, for example, if you've been on steroids, for example, you can get gastritis, irritation of the stomach lining, and that can lead to bleeding in the gut. And that is something that we have noticed in some patients. Likewise, many people have had low hemoglobin to start with, then they've gone on medicines which lower the hemoglobin more, and then they end up anemic. And if you're anemic, then you end up with shortness of that because you don't have enough blood supply in your system. Uh, you were talking about the side effects of the medications that are used for COVID. So could you tell us a little more about what, what kind of, uh, apart from the gastric sure. irritation caused by the steroids, sure. uh, anything else that uh, people should be aware of if they have been treated and also manifests in the post-COVID? Sure. Sure. See, there's, of course, the acute uh, side effects which can happen with all the medicines, but long term, say beyond a month, six weeks, etc. If you've received medicines to suppress your immunity, it, like not just steroids, but other drugs, including, say, immunoglobulins, or if you received uh, these newer drugs like baricitinib, for example, or if you received tocilizumab or, or the, the cytokine storm anti-drugs, if or any of those you received, you may need to watch your immune system not fighting if you get another infection. So there's a condition where your adrenal gland, so very quickly, you have a little gland called the adrenal gland, sits on top of the kidneys. It produces all the stress hormones, adrenaline to fight, and you know, then the steroid medicine, which you normally need in the body, the glucocorticoids, the mineralocorticoids, which keep your blood pressure up. These are normally produced, but sometimes you get steroids from outside. The body says, hey, you know what? I'm getting it from outside. I don't need to make any more, and the body's level goes down. Down the line, if you get an infection and your body has to fight the infection, you do need in your steroids in the body to kick in. But because the body is not producing, it may not happen. And then you need to give medicine from outside to balance that. That's one thing that can happen. The other thing that can happen is long-term effects of steroids can include bringing out diabetes. You can also get a uh, risk of infections. You can also weaken the bones if you're on long-term steroids. And you can also end up with sleep disturbance, for example, just from having steroids for long-term. Other drugs which lower the immunity can put you at risk of tuberculosis coming back out. So a lot of people in India are exposed to TB, but don't have TB as such. But if your immunity goes down, that can happen. So if you're getting a cough or a fever or night sweats that aren't going away, you may want to talk to, talk to your doctor about that, especially if you had TB in the past. 
Um, so regarding this reduction in immunity, is that why we have been uh, hearing so much about these opportunistic infections? Uh, and how does one recognize uh, these symptoms early? Because a lot of them can be picked up early and treated early. Sure. Uh, how prevalent are they too, though we see a lot of them in all the colors possible mentioned? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a good uh, point, Arshinidhi. So if you look at the human body, uh, you have more bacterial cells in you than human cells. One kilo of our body is actually bacteria. So we actually are really living in balance with bacteria, fungi, viruses just to diverge a bit, but if you look at the virus number, there's trillions and trillions of viruses around the planet. In China, they float around the earth. There's a whole thing called the virosphere and they keep falling down on earth every day. Most of them, we don't even know about, they don't bother us, but some like you know, COVID come and affect us. But the reason I bring that up is the body is always fighting. It's a war, you know, the Mahabharata or whatever you want to call it. It's always happening. You're actually fighting bacteria. You're fighting viruses. You're fighting fungi. But there are some good bacteria which are in your body. They produce things like uh, vitamin K. They also produce other chemicals which are useful in the body. And you need them to survive. But if you end up giving antibiotics and kill the good bacteria and the bad bacteria, you end up with a situation with, say, diarrhea, which doesn't go away. You also end up with situations where the fungi, which are usually not bothering you, but because your immune system isn't fighting it, they start growing and they can end up in various parts of the body and you can end up with a skin infection or it can be even more serious where it ends up invading other parts of the body. One particular one is called mucor, which we all heard about, the black fungus. Uh, some of you may have leaky walls from the rains and you see black stuff growing on the walls. Those are fungi and they can actually affect your lungs by causing wheezing. It's a whole separate story like aspergillus, they call it. But you can also end up with mucor, which is an invasive fungus, meaning it invades into blood vessels and tissues. And actually it's kind of gory, but it grows into the back of the nose, into the brain. Now, by the way, when you smell, the, the signals go straight to your brain because your roof of the nose actually has nerve endings, the olfactory nerves, and they kind of come straight out the brain and they actually can get brain infection going up that way too. So that's just a point aside, but you can actually end up with the fungus growing in those directions. And the way to detect it is to one, know the risk factors and the risk factors which they've seen Almost everybody who got a bad case of black fungus or mucormycosis was diabetic and the sugar was out of control. So it's you know shocking, Srinidhi, I'm sure you know this too, but even now in 2021, 30 to 40 years after we know that sugar needs to be kept under control to prevent side effects, especially long-term effects, we still see people who have never checked their HbA1c. Oh, yes, I have seen many recently who... The found out for the first time when they were in hospital. Exactly, exactly. And these are even people who have diabetes. So I think, a, you know, the second take home message, if you're diabetic, check your HbA1c, talk to your doctor about getting a thorough glucose related disease check, because these are all completely preventable. And what we have realized is people who have mucor end up are usually people whose sugar is out of bad control. And then this fungal infection can cause local redness in the eye in the cheek, swelling of the cheek area, the nose. And it can be a simple case of regular sinusitis, but it might be something more serious. So we have seen mucor. If it's picked up early, we can treat it. And you're sure you've all seen the calls going out for in social media asking for amphotericin. So this is one of the very powerful drugs that can actually affect the fungus, but you need to take it for a really long time and have to watch for side effects like kidney side effects, et cetera. We're getting a lot of questions on our feed, but before we go to that, I'd like to ask you one last question uh, about what people uh, who have recovered from COVID, uh, is there anything particular, because that's again something which we see in the social media, both to prevent COVID and in the after uh, period where, you know, there are certain things that you can eat or drink or what kind of lifestyle uh, modifications are needed to make sure that they recover quickly and also, you know, people who are in the habit of having a drink or smoking uh, when when i mean in the sense that you know how long should they i mean I, ideally they should refrain but but then there are a lot of questions about these kind of things what kind of behavior modification should people do sure sure i'm not a health guru i'm sure you can see enough on social media about what to do what not to do i'm sure you know it yourself 
in general, uh, what I'm recommending is the three big areas to focus are diet, nutrition, and sleep. Uh, you can put them together, diet, nutrition, exercise, and sleep. So these are the three big areas to focus on. A lot of us who have been in quarantine end up with losing our sleep cycle. You know, you're binge watching TV or your you know, online media and you forget the time and you, it's three in the morning before you know it and then your sleep cycle's off. So you want to do your best to get back to a proper sleep cycle on average six to or maybe seven to eight hours of sleep. That's very important. Sleep is critical to try to heal and uh, people listening at home who know me are going to say, you know what, you're a hypocrite, you don't sleep much. It's true, you know, doctors generally sometimes don't get to sleep very much, but it's really critical. The more and more data we get out now is showing that of all the things we do in our health, perhaps sleep is one of the number one things. Adequate restful sleep is very important because that helps your immune system and also helps the healing process. The number two thing is exercise. Talk to your doctor about what kind of exercise you can do because a lot of people who had COVID do have lung issues and they may be on oxygen, but you can exercise with oxygen. Some of them have cardiac issues, so they need to look into that. There are also people who have had issues related to muscle weakness. So you want to talk to your doctor about how to get into an exercise program and perhaps you need professional guidance to slowly increase it up and you can do something called pulmonary rehabilitation, physical rehabilitation to actually get this going. And the third, of course, the diet. You know, the thing is, you need a healthy diet and healthy diet is generally balanced. There is no one formula that fits everybody. Fad diets generally don't work, but if you can watch your calorie intake, if you're diabetic, you cannot control the calories and also balance all classes, make sure that you get adequate multivitamins. And generally we, you know, you get all the things you need from food. You don't need extra things generally, if, as long as you're balanced. But sometimes, for example, if you're a vegetarian, you might need a vitamin B12 supplement. Uh, if your vitamin D is low, which most people have a low vitamin D, you may need vitamin D supplements. And there are some schools of thought talking about the benefits of vitamin D supplementation to health in general. And Everything else is, you know, we're learning more and more as time comes on. But as long as it's not crazy expensive and cheap and you can eat a healthy diet, and some people talk about having multiple colors in your diet, you know, as long as you have all the colors that are going together, you should do well. And there are many sources of information for diet, exercise, and sleep. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is a mental health aspect. Many of us have been, you know, totally isolated and cut off, especially if you're elderly, you may have no, not much support. You know, suppose your kids are out of the house, they may not even be able to visit you. And if they're overseas, for example, absolutely not. So it's very important to keep the social connection going. They've done studies where even a simple video call is adequate to establish a linkage. The third thing which you asked us, Dr. Shinidi, is about the alcohol, tobacco, etc. Now, in general, the thinking is alcohol and tobacco have nothing to contribute to health. Alcohol, there is some data suggesting a small amount of alcohol may be good for heart health, but in some societies and cultures, it's much more prevalent. But depending on the quantity that is consumed, there is benefit or harm. And it is surprising if you actually look at the amount of alcohol that's actually safe, Indians far exceed the quantity that's allowed to be had, actually. And you can have a lot of harm. People don't realize, but alcohol, of course, not just the liver, but it can actually cause cancer. It can also cause other health issues, which are broad spectrum in other parts of the body. Tobacco, as you know, has zero benefit to anybody. Uh, it's very important that you quit tobacco if you're using it, partly because it affects your lungs, but also affects all other organ systems. And you may or may not know this, but even hookah, which some people may, were thinking is safe, is actually very unsafe. One hour of hoka is a hundred puffs of a cigarette. So it's very important to try to avoid tobacco use. Uh, the other aspect to look at is trying to figure out because a lot of kids have been affected because they've been you know, online schooling, not able to interact with their friends. And then there's a lot of mental stress that builds up because they're listening to the news and the adults are talking about the dangers of COVID. Many have lost relatives, many have lost grandparents, many have lost other family members. So it's a lot of grief going around. So there's a new concept I recently read about in uh, psychology about just asking that question, how are you feeling today? Not just to yourself, to anybody else. And just asking that one question apparently is helpful in resetting people's mental health and reach out to people who you're seeing, not just in your own household, but outside too, and ask, hey, how are you doing? And apparently that one question is adequate to establish connection. So these are just the various aspects of health, which we should really focus on. 
I'll now read out uh, the questions from our viewers. Um, there are eight of them so far. Good afternoon. I've recovered from COVID-19 and almost 45 days over. Now I'm suffering with numbness of hands and legs. Please advise, is it due to COVID or not? I'm non-diabetic and quite healthy. Sure. See, I think when you have numbness in the hands and legs, uh, you want to, of course, make sure it's not a neurologic thing. There are many neurologic conditions, you're very serious, which can cause numbness. But if it's been happening for a long time, it might be something like a vitamin B12 deficiency. So that's something you want to look at. The other thing is if you're hyperventilating, breathing really fast, that can also cause numbness and tingling in the hands. So I would recommend that since you already recovered, you wear a mask, go into your doctor's office, let them examine you, won't take very long and make an check your vitamin B12 level and some other electrolytes, which can sometimes be low. I do not have uh, any problem except the sleep disturbance. Can it be due to COVID? Uh, absolutely. So I think so when you look at sleep, uh, as we talked about before, there's something called sleep hygiene. The concept of sleep hygiene is not easy to practice because it involves shutting down all your digital devices, phones, smartwatches, television, anything that's got technology in it off and not just off when you go to bed, but several hours before you go to bed, because your brain needs to get into this habit of shutting down. You know, in the olden days, which none of us saw, there was no electricity. So there was sun, sunlight and, you know, in the sunset, there was no light. So in general, so I think so the, essentially your brain is tuned to that and your circadian, circadian is to do with the day night cycle in your brain. That cycle is fairly fixed and with time it changes. But the, when you, if you've traveled overseas or a different time zone, you will know about jet lag. So the brain actually is very, very sensitive to the light reflex. So it's very important that you try to shut down light access. Also, don't stimulate your brain by doing exercise very close to your sleep. Don't drink stimulating drinks like caffeinated drinks like coffee or tea for several hours, maybe an eight, nine hours before your bedtime. Try to set a set bedtime as much as possible. And what you need to do is to, if you're not able to sleep, go lie down in bed. If you're not able to sleep, get out of bed, take a walk not a vigorous walk, just a normal walk. People even suggest not even reading anything or doing anything that can distract your brain, but just kind of sit around, walk around a bit. You could, if you want to read some light reading, if you like, and then go back to bed. The bed is only for sleeping as much as possible. Don't do anything else. Don't eat in it. Don't take phone calls in it. And when you get up in the morning, get out of bed right away. Don't just lay in bed and look at your phone. So your brain needs to get tuned to this habit that the bed is a place to sleep. That's the sleep hygiene concept is very important if you want a good night's rest. And of course, one more thing, uh, there are some medicines which can help. So for example, uh, melatonin is a use for jet lag help. So it, sometimes there are some safe medications which are not uh, habit forming, which may be necessary. So talk to your doctor if the sleep disturbance is not going away. You do, of course, need to make sure there's no medical condition like iron deficiency, anemia, thyroid diseases, these can also cause sleep disturbance. Uh, I have recovered end of May. Uh, even now I'm getting pain when I lift a weight of 15 kg. Sure. Now you've heard this story about playing the piano, Srinidhi. Have you heard that? Somebody mm -hmm. wanted to know, can I play the piano after I recover? Well, if you couldn't play the piano before, you're not going to play the piano after you recover. So likewise, if you were not able to lift 15 kg before, you're not going to be able to lift 15 kg after. The reason I bring it up is a lot of us are fairly euphoric that, you know what, I've recovered from COVID, everything's good. You jump into it. Not ready. So do your best to kind of go slowly, gradually build it up. Weakness in terms of lifting weights could be related to muscles, bones, joints, ligaments, or something else. Say if you have a low hemoglobin, you don't have the enough energy, your blood supply is enough to kind of get the muscle, uh, to pull the muscle to, so that it can actually lift the weight up. If you have a joint issue, that can be a problem. Your form may not be right. You may not be lifting it correctly. So these are all different things. Now, that being said, there are many patients who actually end up with weakness after COVID, and that may take three, four months to recover sometimes, which is why you need to get a professional to guide you in terms of how to actually lift the weight up. Do it in a very sustained way where you start with 5 kg, then build up to 10, then build up to 15. So that's one way to do it. I would recommend you meet with a someone who's well-trained to kind of guide you in this. Can patients develop multi-organ failure after COVID-19 recovery? 
So if you had no uh, risk factors for multi-organ failure, so risk factors might be somebody with septic shock, somebody who had bad diabetes, somebody who's immunosuppressed and had a pneumonia in the lung, for example. If all these things are going on along with COVID, they can get multi-organ failure. However, if you've completely recovered, it'd be very unusual to jump into a multi-organ failure. Although late after a COVID illness, which you're talking about not I'm not talking about the post COVID. I'm talking about within the four week time frame. If you had COVID for two weeks, the third and fourth week, some people end up with an inflammatory phase and they may end up with organ issues. However, uh, in the long term, it is unusual to have organ failure unless it was not picked up. For example, you may have early kidney issues which got worse during COVID. You might have early diabetes which became worse because the sugar wasn't controlled. These things can happen. But in general, very unusual to get multi organ failure after COVID. Um, what about a COPD patient? Should should they take special care in the post COVID? Sure. So very quickly for people who don't know what COPD is, COPD is chronic obstructive lung disease. Quick jump back to anatomy of the lung. We talked about the lung. We stretch it out. You get the whole big tennis court size lung. So what happens with COPD is tobacco use as well as biomass, like people who do indoor burning of uh, fuel to cook. In fact, in India, for example, that may be the number one cause in women where they get COPD. They actually inhale these pollutants and they destroy the lung tissue. So you have an air tube, you have lungs surrounding it. Some lung is destroyed. And what happens then is these air tubes are generally kept open from collapsing because there's a lot of lung tissue around. It's called the elasticity. But if the lung is not there, the tubes start collapsing. When they start collapsing, you end up with oxygen not getting in and carbon dioxide not getting out. You also end up with a situation where you can get a lot of mucus build up in the tubes. And when that happens, you get a situation with the mucus getting blocked inside and breathing difficulty. In COVID, if somebody had COPD and they ended up with COVID, you may end up with difficulty related to the breathing issues. And this may cause wheezing, and you can also have difficulty related to the mucus buildup. So if you did have COVID and you had COPD, it's very important that you do your best to try to prevent these symptoms and also try to use the inhalers that are necessary to take the treatment. You also need to take the treatment such as the anti-inflammatory medicines, which may be required. And some people with COPD may need steroids for a little bit longer time. Uh, two of my cousins, both males in 40s and 30s respectively, are suffering from high BP post-COVID infection. Is this a complication of COVID and do they need further investigations? Sure. So I think one of the issues is hypertension runs in families. So that may be one issue. The second thing is the common factors of hypertension include a salt intake that is high. You don't realize it, but if you look at the junk food and even the regular food you eat, out of habit, you might be dropping salt in your curd rice, for example, or you may be eating chips, which are very high in salt, pickles, very high in salt. So all of these can lead to hypertension. In COVID specifically, sometimes steroid use can lead to higher blood pressure because steroids tend to gather water. So that's one thing that can happen. You can get other factors or some of the other medicines people may be taking or stopped taking during COVID may be triggering high blood pressure. It's also possible that we just picked up the hypertension now because we are checking it because most people don't usually check their blood pressure. So all of these might play a role. Uh, could you comment on controlling diabetes post-COVID recovery uh, after remdesivir treatment for a diabetic patient. So remdesivir itself per se is not a major cause for diabetes flaring up. It's highly possible the person also got steroids along with the remdesivir and the steroids will generally increase the sugar. Now in diabetes, generally you have a balance between the factors which lower the glucose and also the factors which tend to raise the glucose. So the insulin and the glucagon. So these hormones are always in balance. But if the diabetic has a low insulin production or the insulin is not working, then you end up with a situation with the sugars going out of control. So you want to make sure that if you are a known diabetic or a new diabetic, you talk to your doctor about balancing your diet as well as the replacement medicines that are required to control the glucose. So it's very important that you talk to your doctor about this because if the glucose goes out of control, a lot of acid can build up in the body. You can get infections. We talked about the black fungus. You can also get other side effects, including issues like uh, 
the heart issues, especially your cholesterol can go up. So these are all linked to the metabolic syndrome. So it's very important you control, especially that steroid dosing and the diabetes post-COVID. Uh, I'm three weeks since I've tested positive for COVID. Now I'm having joint swelling, pain, uh, swelling up to thigh level from down. And I'm an obese 35 year old. Uh, see, one thing is, is it one leg or two legs? If it's one leg, you really need to clarify. In any case, if there's swelling that's going up all the way, absolutely sign off. Go to your doctor now. Don't watch my program anymore. You need to really check up because it's not normal to have swelling. It could just be related to not moving much and having leaky veins and the leg swelling up. But anytime you have leg swelling, you want to look at several factors. Your protein may be low. You might have a blood clot. You may have issues with heart issues, pumping issues, which lead to fluid buildup. Some drugs cause side effects. Like So really a lot of things can do it. One thing you could do is put a finger on the ankle area and just press and see if it's a dimple forming or not. That may be a useful sign to see if your protein is low, for example, or if the fluid is actually too much in the body. But uh, absolutely hang up, go to your doctor because it's not normal to have that kind of swelling. Um, hello, doctor. I recovered from COVID nearly one month, but now I have... Uh... Sorry. Uh, I have a uh, slight. Sorry. Yeah. I have a foul smell coming from my stomach during mid sleep. Why is this happening? Sure. Um, it's hard to say. One thing is that a lot of times you get acidity, and acid reflux can cause you to get a foul smell from belching, which is the stomach acids coming up or the stomach gas is coming up. It's also possible that there is halitosis, meaning that the dental care is not good or you have sinus congestion and sinus related uh, infection. You can also have sinusitis causing nasal blockage, which can all cause the halitosis or bad smell coming. So it can be any of those. It could be related to acid reflux, sinuses, nasal issues. Those are the general things. There are, of course, rare things. If you're a medical student and you've been asked this, you may have to say, oh, you know what? The kidneys may not be working and you can get the smell of uremia. If you're a diabetic, you could have ketones going up and you get this unusual odor. So there's other medical cause, but in general, it might be related to a upper airway or an acid reflux situation. Um, I'm 48 years old, 50 days after discharge. Oxygen level, pulse, BP, sugar, okay. I'm still feeling a chest tightness, slight vibration when I'm talking, a slight throat pain. Is it normal? Um, no, if it's bothering you, it's not normal. You need to get an answer for it. And this vibration thing might be a little bit of wheezy type thing. Sometimes wheezing feels like that. You might have a little bit of secretions inside, like a bronchitis that might be making that noise when you're breathing and talking. So I think uh, a, a quick listen by your doctor into your front and back of the chest. You may need a chest x-ray. You could also get a lung function test to see if there's any mucus lining issues going on. And sometimes you may need treatment with a medicine to relax the air tubes, a bronchodilator we call it, which may be helpful. Uh, my mother is 61 facing flu-like symptoms after taking COVID vaccine. What to do with this and why is it? So it depends on the time frame. See, right after any of the COVID vaccines, you do get a little bit of a viral symptom. You may get a little fever, local pain in the injection site. And these are because your body is trying to generate immunity against the vaccine product. And that's a good thing. If it lasts more than, say, 24 or 48 hours, then we need to figure out what is going on. It may just be a coincidental allergic symptom. It may be a coincidental regular cold. Let's not forget. While COVID is going on, common cold hasn't gone away, malaria hasn't gone away, dengue hasn't gone away, tuberculosis hasn't gone away, heart attacks haven't gone away. I mean, all these other medical conditions are still there. So I think it's worthwhile remembering that, you know, those things, have, it may be something very simple. Um, what precautions should be take, to be taken post-COVID? Uh, I have been on dialysis a few months and to control the high BP. 
Sure. So I think your nephrologists are experts at chatting with you about COVID. Uh, they have been very, very well tuned, especially we have taken the help of our nephrology colleagues and patients who are very sick, who required the help of very advanced therapies to manage some of these patients in the ICU. But in general, if you have a renal issue and you're on dialysis, if it's a long-term dialysis, your immunity is a little bit on the lower side. If the cause for your kidney issue is a condition where you need medicine to suppress your immunity, again, your immunity is on the lower side. On top of this, if you're a diabetic with dialysis, your sugars need to be controlled. So I would recommend that one, obviously follow the advice of your nephrologist, the kidney specialist. In addition to that, work on making sure that there is hygiene at the entry site where they go in for the cannula, for the fistula where you're getting dialysis. If you have an extra catheter through which you're getting dialyzed, you need to maintain that very hygienic way. On top of that, make sure the rest of your health is okay. Don't ignore the rest of your health other than your kidney health also. Post-COVID, should we have any regular checkups for liver fibrosis? Um, not really. If people have alcohol use related liver damage, they need to probably check for liver fibrosis. In fact, there are many newer techniques. Ultrasound is one. There are some special scans available in our own hospital, for example, where you can actually check how elastic the liver is. And those things have come up to look for cirrhosis. So you do have all these different techniques. But in general, post-COVID, I have not heard or seen any data suggesting very specifically that you need to look for liver fibrosis. You do need to look for lung fibrosis in certain situations. How does COVID affect someone with high triglycerides? Nothing very specific. Now, triglycerides and cholesterol and glucose also are linked to your stress hormone levels. It's possible that if you have a high level of stress, your lipids can go up. If COVID triggered that, you could potentially have a triglyceride issue. Otherwise, not really. I mean, if you're asking this again to a doctor or somebody going to a medical exam, I can make a connection, but not relevant to a general audience where how uh, generally triglycerides are not linked to the COVID situation. So thank you, doctor. I think we've had a very interactive session with a large number of questions, which you have answered so simply and beautifully. Um, I'm sure that Many people who are now recovered from COVID must have found uh, great value in your advice and guidance. Thank you so much for joining here today. Thank you, viewers, for joining. The next session is on 25th of June, that is Friday at 2 p.m. And the topic is Don't Ignore Eye Infections After COVID-19. And this will be discussed by Dr. Rajesh Fogla. Please subscribe also to our YouTube channel to get all the latest information on important healthcare topics. And if you have any more queries, you know that you can reach out to us always on our Facebook page. And till we meet again, don't forget the five W's of COVID-19. What? Follow the COVID-19 appropriate behaviors. When? Every time. Where? Everywhere. Who? Everyone. And why? Of course, to stay protected from COVID-19. Thank you and Namaste.